This is Resolute and the Resolute Leadership Podcast. I am Vince Miller, your founder and host. And today we're in a series looking at men's ministry, discussing the topic of developing a vision for the men's ministry in your church. Welcome to the program. If this is your first time tuning in, well, thank you for joining us. Our mission at Resolute is to disciple and development to lead. And if you're looking for content for your men's group or men's ministry, then you need to go to our website today at beresolute.org. We have a number of great tools for men who are leading other men. Also, if you want to follow us, you can find us on Facebook or LinkedIn. And if you prefer to listen, you can find us on every major feed, including iTunes and SoundCloud. You can follow along right there or also in our app. But now, gentlemen, let's dive in. Well, guys, I'm excited to introduce to you today Roger Thompson. Roger is a good friend and a pastor who has worked in ministry over 40 years. He brings with him a lot of wisdom, and he is the author of a fantastic book called Do the Next Right Thing. He currently works with Man in the Mirror Ministries, which works to equip men in churches to develop their men's ministry. Roger, thanks so much for being with us again today. Thanks, Vince. Good to be with you again. So today I want to talk with you about uh, just discipling men. Um, I, I know that you're a guy who believes that discipleship should be the focus of men's ministry, right? Yes. Okay. So um, while there's a lot of different things that we could focus on in a men's ministry and a lot of ways that we can compare it to other ministries, uh, discipleship is the core focus and it's not a new idea, right? <laughs> no, it's as, as old as Jesus and even before that, yeah. obviously. Well, clearly beginning of time. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you turn back to Deuteronomy, it was the call for Jewish fathers to disciple their families mm-hmm. and to engage. And, uh, of course, Jesus, it was his mantra. He lived and died for this. And he engaged his 12 men in discipleship, which is the reason that you and I are sitting here today, (laughs) is because Jesus discipled people. So why do you believe, though, that discipleship should be the focus of a men's ministry and not something else? Well, I I think I have to start first by defining what we mean by discipleship. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is simply somebody who's following Jesus into ever-growing stations of faith. And what I think we tend to think when you, when you pose the question, why should discipleship be the center of men's ministry? I think the default uh, in most men's minds is, how do I get men into a systematic Bible study? <laughs> and, and again, nothing wrong with that. But yes. discipleship has become equated with books where I read the Bible and I fill in the blanks in the books. Right. So have, I, have you ever been discipled? Well, no, I've never been through that system. I've never right. filled in the blanks. I've never done that. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's a great learning me- mechanism. Yeah. But I think we tend to equate discipleship purely and only with, discipleship, with, with, with Bible study. Yeah, or mental education of some kind. Right. So, we, so okay. I've had people over the years come to me many times, and they've said, you know, where is your discipleship ministry in your church? Huh. And I've... I've said sort of stumblingly, but now I believe it with more conviction. Yeah. I've said, well, I'd like to think that everything we do yeah. is discipleship. Yeah. And so what I want to say is I want to redefine or change a paradigm from talking about men's ministry to talking about a ministry to men. Yeah. Say, say more about that because I, I love the way that you say that because sometimes uh, guys will come to you and they have a concept of what they think of men's ministry as, and it's a program, it's a system, it's a process, but then they, they miss the other side of it, which is how do we really mobilize men? How do we get them to embrace the lifestyle that Jesus lived as laid out in God's word, but not see it as exclusively either a system or a process or on the other end only as a Bible study, right? Right. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yes. I'm, I'm saying that your men's ministry, there, there, does, there is a need. Let me say, first of all, there is a need for men to be alone with other men. And there's discipleship that can happen only in that setting and best in that setting. Setting. Right. But I also want to say that that discipleship is not up to the men's ministry to do. There, it's in, it happens in many, many other places. So in other words, well, let me say it this way. The healthier the church, the less footprint the men's ministry will have. 
or hmm. need to have. Okay, say, say more about in that. In other words, if the church is healthy, you're going to have men involved working with children. You're going to have men in your choir, your worship team, ushering, parking yeah. cars. You're going to have them giving and serving and going on mission teams and, yep. and being part of couples Bible studies and leading adult Bible fellowships. Yeah. So if the church is healthy, there are men everywhere. Yep. That's a ministry to men. And yep. so in, in Man in the Mirror, we are trying to open people's eyes to the fact that, you know, when a guy gets hot about doing a men's ministry, a lot of times what he says, sometimes overtly and sometimes just through his body language, he basically <laughs> says, hey, we're starting a men's ministry. And if you don't come on Saturday morning, you're not worth squat. Yeah. You're not right. serious yeah. about your spiritual life. Exactly. And, and I don't want to convey that because I have elders yes. in our church, men yes. that I would die for and who would die for me. And they are spiritual, godly men. And they don't come to any of our men's ministry stuff. Or, or you've probably <laughs> seen this where you've got a, a, an incredibly committed guy who runs a business, who leads a Bible study at his workplace and is mobilizing men to engage not only with their work, but with life overseas or uh, in their neighborhood or community. And we wouldn't say that they're not engaged in men's ministry, yeah, right? We, we should be, and, and let me finish my thought about my elders. Yeah. I don't hold them <laughs> yeah. guilty for that. I applaud them because they are fully engaged as yes. disciples doing what God has assigned them to do. Yeah. And, and so with your thought, yes, I think we need to go find that guy and be a cheerleader for him and affirm him to say, you know what? You are doing what God wants you to do. And I couldn't do that. Nobody else in our church could do that. But Jesus has deployed you to do that. That's our ministry to men. Okay, and so, it's our ministry through men. Yes, And so we go. need to have a much bigger framework to say, let's look around. What, what can we accomplish in man-only situations? And what are the most important things? Let's do that in our men's ministry. And then let's affirm men who are growing as disciples in every other aspect of our church's life. Yeah, so what I hear you saying is that we we need to have a larger view for what men's ministry could be or a larger vision, not be so exclusive or myopic about saying it's only a Bible study and if numbers come to my Bible study then I'm successful or if we don't if we have a hundred men that come to a men's retreat, then we're successful. It's more about how are we mobilizing men throughout the throughout the church. We're giving them opportunities to grow in their faith by using their gifts and exploring service and projects and engagement with the whole church, not just with us. That, that really is Absolutely. a healthier view, it sounds like. Yes, we have a man in our church named John who retired, oh, I don't know, 15 years ago from teaching. Very vigorous guy, and his ministry was to... Uh, was to our our church camp, where uh, there are so, uh, hundreds and hundreds of first time decisions for Christ made every summer, and thousands of rededications. and And John started taking trips to to Trout Lake to to do building up there. And he's probably got thirty men in our church who go with him. It's very quiet. It's under the radar. They go up there and they do tremendous work. They've given m literally millions of dollars of free labor, skilled labor, to this camp where children come and are, are saved and discipled, you know, I mean, yeah, he's a Bible student, but they don't go and study the Bible. Right. They, they go and work. They have fellowship. They encourage one another. Some of these guys have had accidents at the camp. They've gone <laughs> to the hospital with each other. They, they, I, th I think I could safely say they have a brotherhood that's been born of physical labor, shoulder to shoulder, that most of us men would envy. Yeah. And it's happened because he's exercising what God has given him as his vision and gift, and he's included other men in that. And I see personal spiritual growth in those men. Okay. They're more committed to our church. They're, they're more committed to the mission of the camp. Yeah. And I think they're more committed to each other as a result of that. That's so funny because I, I think I know a little bit of that story. I've actually heard that told up at Trout Lake Bible Camp before. Mm -hmm. Funny thing was I spoke at a men's retreat uh, this last week at Camp Victory, if you're familiar with oh, that, yeah. in Zambretta Falls. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had just finished building a... Uh, oh, what is it? A dining hall. It's brand new. And the contractor was out there and the camp director came into the hall and said, the guy who built this is right outside. Tell him thank you because he built it on his own dime. Hmm. It's incredible. Built it on yeah. his own dime with yeah. volunteers. 
Yeah. And I, I looked at it. I mean, we're talking about a million dollar facility that he built on his own dime with other guys that were yeah. out there laying stones and uh, finishing the woodwork and laying the carpet. And I'm like, yeah, that is ministry. And it's not only ministry to men, it's a men's ministry that actually is mobilizing the forward movement of the gospel in amazing ways because I was eating in a facility with other men that needed to hear about Jesus Christ along with all kinds of other kids and children and adults and families that were being changed by that. I I think Mm -hmm. that's a bigger vision for men's ministry than probably we uh, care to embrace sometimes. And the way that stays on track is that the pastor or the leader sees what's happening and reminds that guy. Yeah. Thank you for serving Jesus in this way. Because yeah. it's easy for us to substitute, you know, sweaty hard work from, mm-hmm. from the worship and service of Jesus. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I remember an incident out of Everybody Who Loves Raymond, <laughs> uh, where his father is an usher at the church. <laughs> yeah. And these ushers are in the back room, and all the only reason they're ushering is so that they can avoid the service. Exactly. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's not the kind of labor we want to affirm. Yeah. We want to affirm. You're not doing, you're not building log cabins to avoid. Yeah other yeah. work this is your spiritual worship yeah and i love that i love to come alongside men yeah. and say you know don thank you because in your serving jesus in this way you made it possible for these things to happen and all of us kind of lose sight of that we yeah. lose sight of what our ministry does for others and we have a great opportunity to encourage men uh in their discipleship by doing that yeah you know i wonder roger if if we don't really need to embrace this new vision for men's ministry, not a new, it's not really new, but in our time, in our culture today, this sounds like it works, right? Mm-hmm. It, it, it works for men in their time, in their place, with their gifts, you know, facing some of the challenges we talked about last time and the problems that men have regarding competent, competency or their gift that they bring to bear to the kingdom or the way that they lead or how they engage or the time they have. It sure sounds like to me, if we could cast a bigger vision for what our men's ministry looks like, not exclusively as a Bible study or as a single event, then maybe we'd create broader engagement. Have you, I know you see, you're seeing this work at your church because you lead there, but have you seen this work in other churches across our our country? Oh, yes. I, I, I mean, I think I think that there are many churches that are, maybe they just, they just need to rename it or refocus on it, but there are many churches that are very successful in reaching hunters or fishermen or right. softball players or yeah. basketball kids. Yeah. And um, it's not viewed as men's ministry, though. It's yeah. viewed as sort of an offshoot of something. It's just viewed as fun or whatever. But I think we need to affirm that, you know, these things can be used as doorways yeah. to discipleship. Yeah. And, you know, on the other end of the spectrum... Many churches are mobilizing men in things like Stephen Ministry to go yes, to hospitals and correct. care for others and, and to be that listening ear, um, you know, to help uh, NGOs and nonprofits in, uh, in um, ravaged areas like Houston and Florida right. and places like that. I think we need a much bigger vision for those of us who are leading to go and affirm those men and just remind them and refocus them on why they're doing this. and. Yeah. thanking them for serving Jesus because of what it means to us. You know, I don't know what you think about this, and maybe this would be a good place for us to close. And Maybe I'm opening up a big topic, but <laughs> we'll see. Uh, you know, I, I kind of have felt like, and I know Man in the Mirror teaches this as well, that the engagement of a pastor, of a men's leader, and of a men's team uh, is, is a powerful, can, can create powerful movement in a church. And if I have seen churches... Uh, live out a vision like you're talking about, where you're saying, let's move toward a ministry that mobilizes men rather than tries to retain and capture them in certain environments, right? right? But I know that there is something powerful when you have a senior pastor who understands this kind of a vision and a passionate men's leader who wants to spearhead it along with a team of other men. When they get this, they start affirming this. And it, it seems like you're, you're kind of moving with the stream a little bit more. And then that stream turns into a river and it starts to embrace a little bit of a new vision. Uh, would you say that those, those people elements right there are very important to involve and uh, in, in creating some of this momentum? Well, absolutely. I mean, the pastor doesn't have to be 
that man's man, you know, that goes <laughs> goes out and skins a buffalo every morning before right. breakfast. But he he's absolutely essential to give his affirmation to somebody who does want to reach men. Yeah. Because it's going to go nowhere if the pastor is is fearful mm-hmm. or threatened by someone else uh, fulfilling a role that he wishes he could fulfill but perhaps never can. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, the pastor's role is essential, but pastor's got to have a team. Yeah. Uh, in fact, it's better if the, the team has the pastor rather than the pastor has the team. Yeah, yeah. so in other words, the, the senior guy is supporting, cheerleading, engaged as needed, and then you've got some sort of passionate leader at the helm calling calling for the vision and leading the way and you got a team of guys around him mobilizing other people that's kind of what it it sounds like to me is the, yes. the, the senior guys just behind it and and he loves what's going on he supports it and maybe gives some to it as time allows absolutely and and uh, I guess uh, uh, truth in advertising here <laughs> even when you have that, even when you have a team and you have a pastor fully pulling for that and you have an environment that's conducive to ministry to men, I believe it is the hardest ministry to sustain in the local church. Yeah. So let's not get dazzled about yeah. how this is going to just fall into place. It is going to be an uphill uh, pull. That doesn't mean it isn't rewarding, yeah. but it is it is hard to sustain because we think it ought to be easy. <laughs> and that's the subject of another podcast. Yeah, that's the subject of <laughs> All right, Roger, thank you so much. This is very insightful, and we look forward to having you back again. Thank you. Well, that's the show. Thanks for listening. As we close, I want to remind you of two things. First, Roger Thompson is hosting a No Man Left Behind seminar in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. So if you live around here and you're looking for a tool to equip you to lead the men of your church, you have to go to this event. It's called No Man Left Behind. It's a one and a half day seminar that will train you and give you time to plan, discuss, and consult with your leadership team. And it will leave you with a game plan to reach all of the men of your church with powerful vision and a sustainable strategy. There's nothing like this on the face of the planet. It is fantastic. It's like drinking from a fire hose of leadership that's going to equip you and inspire you to lead the men around you. You need to attend it. If you want to find out details about about this event that Roger is hosting, just go to beresolute.org forward slash no man left behind. It's forward slash no man left behind. Go there to today to get tickets or to register. And I would highly encourage you to bring a man or two with you to this event. Also, if you're looking for men's content, uh, we have great content for men on our website for you. Excellent small group videos and participant handbooks that will empower the men of your church to lead. Go to our website today, beresolute.org, and find out more. And with that, I hope you enjoyed this podcast, but please know that the time that we spent together today is worthless unless you choose to act on it. So do something today by getting off the bench and into the game, and I'll see you right back here next time for another edition of the Resolute Podcast. Podcast.